Okay. Uh, we acknowledge that we all are across Canada gathered in the territories of various Indigenous peoples, and we further recognize their stewardship of these lands in which we live, learn, work, and play. So wherever you are uh, today, uh, please uh, pay, uh, you know, respect to the uh, people uh, who were the original inhabitants. So um, this webinar is about curatorial thinking. And so many of you have uh, read uh, the advertisement already, but um, curatorial thinking makes sense of information and creates meaningful stories. And we're hoping that it serves as an effective framework for engaging in critical inquiry via multiple entry points. And of course, uh, we have the great people from Defining Moments Canada who are going to demonstrate how this uh, framework works to us today. So thank you again. Uh, we have uh, Jennifer Terry, Neil Orford, Madeline Mant, Craig Brumwell, Rob Bell, Sandy Braha, Anna Patterson, and Jean Tong, who will be sharing their information with us today. Shall I start sharing? And I will turn it over to Jennifer. Awesome. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, everyone coming today. I see, keep seeing people coming in from the waiting room and it's it's exciting. I see a lot of names I recognize. So hello. Um, I am going to hand it over to Defining Moments Canada's president, Neil Orford. I'm sure he's a familiar face to many of you to do a quick welcome and then we will really get into things. Oh, thanks, Jen. And uh, hello, everybody. I want to welcome you today to uh, a really exciting opportunity for us and a great collaboration with OHASTA. So on behalf of the whole team at Defining Moments Canada, I want to welcome you uh, all into the world of curatorial thinking, a rich toolkit of inquiry thinking that sounds really innovative and new, but as I think you'll discover is actually quite familiar. In fact, I bet that many of you are already doing curatorial thinking in your classes uh, already. Uh, I'm constantly inspired by all of the curatorial thinking models you'll see today. And the great news is how they have brought history to life for so many rich and diverse audiences in this country. Uh, refracting learning and engaging ways that by and large, I think will be totally recognizable to you. As I said, it's a pleasure to co-host this webinar with OHASTA, an organization that I joined for when I first started teaching back in 1986, uh, dinosaur years ago, uh, and has a great history of promoting best practices among its membership. So my thanks to Rachel and Vanessa and the whole executive for continuing that fine tradition for the legions of new and veteran history and social science teachers across Canada. Defining Moments Canada began in 2016 with a mission to tell the untold stories from voices too often unheard in the grand sweep of Canadian history narrative. From the start, we have been committed to the value of micro histories, the small, often quiet stories that can get lost in the, uh, in the din of myth-making. In our projects as diverse as the Spanish flu commemoration, uh, D-Day, uh, the um, VE Day celebrations that we uh, sponsored last year, um, the uh, discovery of insulin, which is our big project right now, and the groundbreaking research of Dr. Gerhard Hertzberg, we have always attempted to curate the stories from communities and individuals and organizations that expose Canadian identities as a museum curator would explore in her exhibit uh, displays. And that's really what's at the heart of curatorial thinking doing history as a wonderful curator at a local museum might. Different from many heritage organizations in Canada, Defining Moments Canada is built on partnerships. We take a collaborative and team building approach with all of our projects, and we hire largely young scholars and teachers to conduct our research and curate our resources. Just as an excellent history teacher, like all of you are, our mission is to broaden the reach of our shared narratives and make history as accessible as possible. We're a nonprofit and everything on the DMC website is free. Go and steal it. That's the promise we've made to our partners at Heritage Canada and all the stakeholders in Defining Moments Canada. We intentionally want you to download the great lesson plans we design around curatorial thinking and start a conversation around it with your colleagues. Experiment with the ideas in your departments 
and share some awesome student work with us so we can send it to the world. Over the next two years, we'll be undertaking some bold new national projects that we hope you will share with your students, either in a face-to-face -face classroom, wouldn't that be nice, or virtually or whatever kind of concoction we come back to in September. These are gonna be experiences where you can integrate curatorial thinking into your daily practice, the way our terrific guests today will be demonstrating for you. My personal thanks to all the participants today from right across the country and to the team at Defining Moments Canada, which grows by the day and does such rewarding work on all of our projects. Defining Moments Canada is based in Orangeville, Ontario, where I am. And before I pass it back to Jen uh, to start the proceedings, we really must uh, start today by respectfully acknowledging that here, Dufferin County resides within the traditional territory and ancestral lands of the Petun, the Neutral, the Haudenosaunee, the, and the Anishinaabe peoples. We also acknowledge that various municipalities within the County of Dufferin reside within the treaty lands named under the Haldeman Deed of 1784 and two of the Williams Treaties of 1818, Treaty 18, the Nottawasaga Purchase, and Treaty 19, the Adjance Treaty. These traditional territories upon which I live and learn are steeped in the rich Indigenous history and traditions. It is with this statement that I declare to honor and respect the past and present connection of Indigenous peoples with this land, with its waterways and its resources. Having said that, I will turn it back to Jennifer to start today. Thanks, Neil. Uh, so we've, you've been welcomed. Uh, Vanessa did a great job running through the people that are here with us today to present to you and I'll introduce them as we come across each of them as well. So we're going to start by telling you what curatorial thinking is and how you're probably already doing it. I will talk a little bit about all of the resources that are currently available on the Defining Moments Canada website. We'll have a breakout discussion about what you've already learned about curatorial thinking. Uh, and then we're going to show you some real life examples of applications and assessments and we'll conclude with some Q&A. So getting right into things. Uh, once again, you can see all our wonderful presenters, but I will pass it over to Dr. Madeline Mant from the University of Toronto Mississauga, who has been a great asset to our, to our team this year and is really taking curatorial thinking and made it into something that people can do and really think about. Uh, take it away, Maddie. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jen. So I'm Dr. Madeline Mant. I'm an incoming assistant professor in the anthropology of health at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. But most importantly, I'm really privileged to be an academic advisor with Defining Moments Canada. And I've got a really immense interest in interdisciplinary thinking and research. So I'm really excited to be kicking things off here with just a brief introduction to what is curatorial thinking before handing this off to my colleagues to talk about some really fabulous examples and applied examples of how this is being done. So I'm going to talk here pretty briefly about three main points, the what is it, why do it, and the wait, am I already doing it? This is the sort of, this is the call coming from inside the house kind of moment, and I assure you that it most definitely is. So curatorial thinking in brief is a framework for encouraging students to think and demonstrate their learning in an interdisciplinary way. So Jen, would you mind just popping to the next slide there? I want to talk about here, thinking about curatorial thinking and its ability to help with some of the following key points. So we wanna help students make sense of information. This is particularly important in our increasingly digital world, no more so demonstrated than this past year. And especially considering the sort of glut or morass of information that we actually have available to us through online learning, which you know the amount of information available can be good, but can also be a little overwhelming. We really wanna help students effectively create and communicate meaningful stories. And we're gonna come back to that so many times when we talk about some of these applied examples. But really importantly, we also want students to build a strong sense of social responsibility and awareness. This is guiding students to think about their own positionality, their own biases, and also to consider themselves as historical actors in their own rights. So we ask, why do curatorial thinking? While we were thinking, you know, as DMC, and I'm sure as you were as teachers as well, thinking about some of these concepts, you know, pre-COVID and the before times, but the pandemic has really clearly emphasized just how important it is to consider various factors across disciplines when approaching questions of problem solving. So curatorial thinking, we think, is a way of empowering students. This is the term I come back to every time I think about it or dream about curatorial thinking, is that concept of empowerment. The idea of saying to a learner, you can best decide in some cases your own best way into a topic or a problem. 
I think this helps break down that kind of fairly simplistic, are you a visual and auditory a kinesthetic learner? And I always thought I'm visual and visual only. And then years, you know, years passed and realized that really wasn't the case. I was taking in information in so many different ways, but being provided with opportunities to choose and to combine things in an interdisciplinary way really helped me to demonstrate my own learning. This is this idea of providing multiple entry points for a personal type of meaning making. So we are really, really strongly pushing for the idea of breaking down institutional silos, thinking about how both modern and historical problems cross boundaries. A problem doesn't tend to only be a science problem or only be a math problem, strangely enough, in our very complicated world. So how can we help students become better critical thinkers? How can we get students to think about problems as chances for collaboration and inquiry? So curatorial thinking does provide some tools for that. So just coming back to the, wait, am I, am I already doing this? Yes, I believe that you are. You're just probably not using this specific lexicon yet. So through this framework, we hope that students feel flexible and that they can appreciate that both the process um, and the product can be sort of uh, judged alongside one another. All of this relating, of course, to reviewing and acknowledging one's own position in time and space. So I just want to get to that last point there, this idea of biocultural perspective and syndemic thinking. So this comes from my background as an anthropologist. You know, we know that we live in a biocultural space where both our biology, our physiology, as well as our sociocultural context is health, affecting our health, as well as how we are perceiving and navigating the world. So this biocultural concept is really, really commonly used in anthropology, where my background lies, where we explicitly discuss integration of these various threads. So when we move into the concept of syndemic thinking, this is a term building upon the work of a medical anthropologist named Meryl Singer. And he coined this term syndemics to talk about situations. He's specifically thinking about disease processes, but essentially when two diseases, they could be acute or chronic, infectious or not, they actually interact within an individual body. And the interaction between these diseases can be affected or exacerbated by an individual's socioeconomic and sociocultural context. So this idea of bringing this kind of thinking, this actual marrying of different concepts together, we think bringing this kind of thinking, pushing past just the synergy and actually into the syndemic, incorporating the biological as well as the cultural equally is a really major part of the foundation of this idea of curatorial thinking. Because this is happening. <laughs> Whether we're conscious of it or not, curatorial thinking is a really good way to break down some of that siloing, to think about acknowledging, appreciating, and then harnessing that really biocultural or inter interdisciplinary way of thinking, and then starting to apply it to questions of history, of health, of science, and I think probably of so much more. So that's my that's my pitch to sort of start things out. I'd love to pass the mic on, I think, to Sandy Raha next, who's going to talk a bit about curatorial thinking's transdisciplinary potential. And then we're going to return to me and get into some of the nuts and bolts of the how we're actually thinking about doing curatorial thinking with your students. Uh, yeah, so uh, Dr. Sandy Braha from the McMaster Children and Youth University is going to briefly talk about that wonderful institution and how it's kind of the ultimate real life uh, activation of curatorial thinking. And Sandy, <laughs> if you want me to go to the McMaster, the MCYU website, I think I can do that. Just let me know. Okay, so I think what I'll do is I'll just introduce the slide and then uh, while I'm talking, I will have you go to the website if you don't mind. Okay. Um, so uh, hi everyone, and I'm really glad to be here. And I'm going to start off by admitting that I am probably the only person who doesn't have a history background on this call. Um, I am a, a hardcore scientist, but let me tell you how curatorial thinking comes into play for me. Uh, I came through the, the education system as a PhD trained in very hardcore quantitative sciences. And as I started to practice my uh, research, I realized that I was constantly going back uh, and referring to data and experiences um, and, and bringing that forth in order to innovate the future. Um, and then this kind of concept, this multidisciplinary concept is what really inspired us to start the McMaster Children and Youth University. Um, so MCYU, as the acronym goes, is uh, based out of the McMaster. And what we try to do there is really leverage the expertise, the multidisciplinary expertise that's on campus. Um, and we apply it to kids in the community. So our, our primary demographic is really the middle school uh, kids. But um, yes, thank you uh, very much, uh, Jen. This, this is the MCYU website. Um, 
<clears throat> and um, what, uh, what we try to do is really bring um, this curatorial thinking concept to families and classrooms. Uh, the, our overarching goal is to create engaged citizenship. And we do that through our primary credo, which is question, discover, create. And you'll see that sort of in the center of the screen there. Um, and question, discover, create is essentially um, really is a synonym for some of the SAS framework that Dr. Matt will be talking about in a minute. Um, but what I'd like to do is just give you a brief uh, summary of how we apply this, and then we can continue the discussion uh, in the breakout rooms if anyone's interested. So our programming is, uh, has really three primary components. The first is a uh, series of family lectures. This is where we, in the pre-COVID days, uh, used to get families to come on campus. We would um, provide transportation to bring in um, families from priority neighborhoods, under uh, resource neighborhoods, to really listen to ongoing uh, work, research, um, subject areas from experts in on campus and in the community with the purpose of instigating questioning. Um, and that was really, that really proved to be very valuable because we would anecdotally hear that, you know, weeks and months after kids had learned the lectures, there would be a conversation at the dinner table about some of the content. Um, and that was very inspiring to us. Um, we also have in the context of our uh, program, uh, what we call our MCYU in the city program, or these are really family workshops. Um, They're designed to be roll out to public libraries, community centers, but also we go out to the schools and, and really the largest segment of our uh, workshop um, workshops do go out to the schools. Um, and what we do here is we train McMaster students on how to deliver inquiry-based workshops in a multidisciplinary format. Um, and they go out and interact with kids with the purpose of getting them to critically think about the topic, not necessarily to um, practice a certain skill set. Critical thinking is really the main objective of these workshops. And, a, and an example of this is what we did this year with, uh, you'll hear Rob Bell talk about uh, a number of um, topics. You'll hear about the Hazel project, so I won't touch on that. But in the context of our insulin, the, the 100 years of insulin, um, the, the project we did with his class was to uh, get our students to initiate conversations about the uh, sociology, the social impact of diabetes. We got them to talk about the biology of the disease. We got them to talk about the ethics of the disease um, so that they would have questions about those kinds of topics. And then we turn them loose to really discover the information. We, we help to guide them through various sources. Um, and their, their goal, and, and, and Rob may touch on this a bit later, is, is to create a project. And then this year, I believe he's putting together a book to be published around the information the kids um, really generated. And this, 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 is, this is what we do. And the key piece here is we do this sort of on a customized basis. And so we have some uh, one hour workshops that you can um, preview on our website and Jennifer will pass along the links so, so you can look at them. And those are really a one hour experience where we um, provide some inquiry and we challenge the kids, we provide them tools to create and we walk them through this experience. What yeah. we're doing here with Rob is a much bigger project. Um, and this lasted over about three weeks. Mm -hmm. And so finally, just to wrap up, the other piece that we've really started because of the pandemic is uh, a digital version of our face-to-face -face workshops. And um, you can see some of that on our website. Um, and so all of our program is freely accessible. Um, 
and I and I really want to um, emphasize that the key thing about our programming is we work very closely with the teachers as well as uh, we have a youth advisory board. And so this is really community based learning. One of the key things with our all of our uh, workshops is that we want to ensure that our mentors, our facilitators, learn just as much as the kids in the classroom. And so this is collaborative learning. Um, and with that, I'll stop and turn it back to, uh, is it Dr. Mant, I guess, will go next? Yes, back to Dr. Mant for the SAS framework. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. That really, that's perfect. You're sort of going to pitch it up and I'm going to hopefully knock it out of the park here. This is great in terms of giving folks some tools to start doing this. So what is SAS? I mean, other than just what I've already got, obviously, but a SAS here, it's a framework, right, for operationalizing what we're talking about here. This is something visual to give your students, to give them these steps, to give them tools to start achieving some of these, I hope, really marvelous projects that you're already dreaming up. So I just want to talk you through these steps here so that you can familiarize yourself with it. This will be up in our breakout rooms, I believe, as well, so we can kind of start engaging with it. But just to talk you through the four steps here, the first is selection. So this is you know, combing and starting to sift through some of that fabulous information that's available. This is looking through both primary and secondary resources, encouraging students to start choosing that way into a question. So we encourage people to think about physical objects. Is it, you know, a, a recording of a historical figure speaking? Is it a digital museum exhibit, a library book? Could it be something personal like a cherished, you know, item from a student's grandparents, etc.? Through the idea of selecting, sifting through and picking out the types of evidence, this is really clearly starting to engage with that critical thinking, where again, a student is empowered to choose that source or a series of sources and start to address some broader research questions using their choices. So we might ask students at this point, you know, what is relevant to your question? What is adding value to my question or approach? And just what, you know, what is useful? What do we need at this time? Moving into the second step of archiving, this is really asking students to start thinking along the lines of an archivist. How do we start making meaning out of what we found? We can sift through and choose some fabulous items, but then what are the connections we're going to start to build between them? Uh, this is basically encouraging students to think of some broad groupings that might aid in organizing their evidence. This can lead to asking ourselves again a series of questions, starting to probe into some of the evidence, asking things like, what's missing? And why might it be missing? Are we starting to see those biases or those lacunae in the information? What's most important for my question out of these items that I've already gathered? You know, who's keeping what and why might certain materials have been saved over others? This is clearly for the historical context. And then we can start to get into asking ourselves whose voices might actually be in more need of amplification which helps us go into that point, the third point here of sense making. And I think you'll gather that sense making is pretty clearly an aspect of the entire process, but I like thinking of it as a third and specific item as well to start talking about the actual creating of the project, whatever that might be. So this is the analysis. This is really just an approachable way of labeling, of making those connections, preparing an actual project or product, um, and thinking about the time for students actually need to collect their thoughts to make these connections and start answering these research questions. Then we get to, I think, my favorite part, the sharing, where you get to see what everybody was working on. So this is the idea where producing something, of course, is important in the end. And we, I'm a really strong believer in thinking about the process as being as important as the product. But it's really important, too, for students to have a goal to work towards and also to have the opportunity to reflect upon and present their work. So this helps us give students space to reflect upon their narrative intent. And this sharing step also helps students consider their own positionality, again, as historical actors, as they're constructing and they're sharing their narratives based upon their work to really clearly demonstrate what their learning is. So, I mean, this resonates, I hope, with you when thinking about your in-person classrooms, but thinking about our roles as historical actors during this pandemic has been really important too. Reflecting with my own students, I've opened up a lot of conversations by just saying, well, do you think any, did anybody here choose to live through this major <laughs> structural historical event? Nobody raises their hands, of course, but thinking about the idea of things being done to us as well as how we react to them is a really important part of thinking about our roles as historical actors. And I think what really resonates for me through this process and thinking through the SAS framework is really acknowledging how many different types of evidence are valid and really encouraging students to think about how maybe no approach might be better than, than another. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic back to Jen now, who I think is gonna introduce us to you a little bit more about how Defining Moments Canada specifically is already doing some of this work. Uh, yes, absolutely. I'm very excited to do so. So as Neil talked about right at, the, right at the top, we do digital heritage education projects. And so each project focuses on a specific 
defining Canadian moment in our history and we look at them through untold stories to provide and provide educators the tools to bring it into their classrooms but the tools of curatorial thinking and the tools for storytelling that are combined with each content project can be applied across the content that you need to teach in your classrooms so just because we're talking about insulin doesn't mean that you can only use these tools if you are teaching insulin um, so the, what you see on the screen here are our aims and our goals, what our priorities are in creating our educational content. Um, and I'm going to run through existing resources on our website to talk about how they activate curator curatorial thinking. I will make sure that all of the links to everything I talk about are circulated afterwards. It's all available on our website, but you don't need to try and dig it up and find it now. And I'm not going to try and swim through the whole website right now. So the first project we did a few years back was the centenary of the 1918 flu pandemic. And at the beginning of last year, the content for this project got, suddenly became very relevant and very interesting to everyone, but the story building and storytelling tools have always been applicable. The lesson plans for the flu project correspond to a range of different subject matters. There are science lessons, history lessons, art lessons, indigenous uh, in, Indigenous history lessons. Uh, and the idea was that students needed to learn from multiple perspectives in, aid, in order to be able to tell a full story of the Canadian flu story. Just as if you were trying to talk about COVID, you would need to cross disciplines entirely and talk about health and society and geography and economics as well as history. So at the core of all of this was a number of strong tools that helped to build skills in storytelling, uh, both hard and soft. So both in constructing narratives and learning how to write stories uh, and research stories, but also in how to share those stories through digital means. At the core of all that is the seven sentence story structure. And so I'm going to play a short video that will talk about what's involved in the seven sentence story structure and building stories and suggest it also works on suggesting some applications. Uh, awesome. So you can tell stories about anyone, about anything. And this seven-sentence story structure is really uh, the, the 
the seeds of curatorial thinking. You need to select all the pieces and archive those which don't fit. And that those seven sentences are a framework through which to apply the sense making. And obviously telling the story is the sharing. And uh, one way we've seen the seven sentence story structure shared in a wonderful way is through Twitter. We've done this through promotional tools for ourselves, but um, we've also seen it used at in classrooms at different levels. Uh, but we used it primarily for our next project, Juno 75. And with the Juno 75 lessons, we really focused on ways to curate a strong commemoration. Uh, the first lesson introduced the concept of commemoration, and how you can make an effective one. And in the second lesson, we really get into the selection of that SAS framework. Students select a subject or an individual for commemoration and they use multiple entry points to gather information. Archiving and sense making comes in with the third lesson. It's a more nuanced analysis of the information they gathered. And they share their commemoration or their story in the fourth lesson by leveraging digital resources to create an effective digital commemoration. And while these tools specifically use Juno 75 as the vehicle for that commemoration, you could pick any topic that you need to deal with in your classroom. It could be a sports event, another military commemoration, a local figure or a local event that's important to your group, uh, whatever really, whatever works for you and whatever is relevant to your classroom. Uh, the next project we did where we really, we really got into the dynamic curatorial opportunities involved in story mapping with VE Day 75. Um, so in addition to a number of story maps created for our virtual exhibit by Project 44 and in collaboration with the Juno Beach Center, uh, we created a series of lessons, Craig Brumwell created a series of lessons that he's going to tell you more about the activation of and his use of, um, that helped to bring story mapping into the classroom and Jean Tong will talk about that when she talks about Esri, but I'll just run through the lessons very quickly. The first introduced the key concepts relevant to a military commemoration, contribution, sacrifice, uh, and the resources that are available to you and to your students through Project 44. Uh, the second lesson analyzes those story maps using the big, the seven sentence story structure, as well as the big stick, six historical concept, excuse me, the big six historical thinking concepts, um, and connects individual actions to collective accomplishments. Uh, in lessons three and four, students have an opportunity to create their own story maps and then combine those story maps to create a larger story of, in this case, the liberation of the Netherlands. And lesson five was actually created after the fact in March 2020, when we all had to suddenly move online and it highlights the resilience that students needed to show in comparison to the resilience shown in the Second World War. Um, and throughout these lessons and throughout creation of story maps, both the seven sentence story structure and curatorial thinking are key. You need to select the pieces that you're going to tell and select the places on that story map, uh, archive and sense make through the whole thing in order that you're not just jumping around on the map and you're telling a cohesive story. And the story map is obviously a fantastic way to share what you've just curated. And our current project, Insulin 100, uh, a huge aim with this project was to be transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. And we looked at Frederick Banting as the ultimate example of a groundbreaking scientist. And students have to demonstrate this in, or, or argue against it if that's how they, that's what they choose. But how does his interest in the arts play in? How does his interest in philanthropy and, and really doing good for the for the people of Canada play into him being a groundbreaking scientist. It's not just his serendipitous discovery of insulin, but all of the different things that made him who he was. Uh, and insulin as a very scientific and medical discovery that has a huge scope of impact on Canadians, both back in 1921 and today. And obviously insulin earned Canada its first Nobel Prize. So the lessons draw connections between that historic discovery and very contemporary impacts. Lesson number two actually introduces curatorial thinking and the SAS framework that Dr. Mant outlined. Um, and lesson number one has students select pieces from discovery cards to storyboard the discovery story of insulin, which is, if you're not familiar, a very fraught story. It can go many different directions. You can pick different heroes, different villains, uh, and, and tell the story in a lot of different ways. And if you read Dr. Chris Reddy's work on our website, you can see that there's a lot of different angles you can take. So students are given the opportunity to curate their own story and based on the pieces they pick, they can tell many different stories. Lesson number three asks an ethical question about prioritizing research for a cure for diabetes. And is that something we should do? Students have to pick and choose facts from across disciplines, history, science, economics, 
uh, et cetera, to, to decide whether or not they should argue in favor of prioritizing that research. Lesson number four compares stories of different Canadians who have been impacted by diabetes and insulin and asks if that impact has been equitable. And lesson number five, students have to make a case for scientific literacy for, 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 for all through the creation of an infographic. And they have to use SAS to build that argument, select whether or not, select pieces that, that are for or against it, archive and sense make in order to do it and share it through an infographic. Uh, so those that's what's available on our website right now. There, it's a huge amount of stuff. We're always creating more. And as we've emphasized, it's all completely free. Uh, and I think now we are going to move into some breakout sessions. So uh, yes. I will let Vanessa or Vanessa take it from here and figure out how that's going to happen. <laughs> So um, I have breakout rooms ready to go. And if you look in the uh, chat forum, um, I have put a link to the uh, Google file, which has this uh, SAS um, slide in it. So in your uh, breakout rooms, you can have a discussion around the questions on the slide. And I'll, we'll give you about 10 minutes um, in your breakout rooms. So I'll um, set that up right now. Now we're going to have some other folks show off to you what they've done with curatorial thinking in, in, real, in the real world, things they've actually done, ways they've actually done assessment uh, that will hopefully help to inspire you uh, a little bit. So I'm going to start off by passing it off to Anna Patterson from the Dundas Museum and Rob Bell from, Rob, I'm forgetting the name of your school, I'm so sorry. <laughs> But uh, they are going to talk about two projects they did, the Fatal Five and Finding Hazel. And if you, at whatever point you want me to switch to the next set of pictures, just let me know. Sure thing. All right. Can you hear me okay there, Thanks, Jennifer? Jennifer? Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, thank you, everybody. It's, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I teach at uh, Dundas Central Elementary School. Uh, I'm a grade five, six teacher. Uh, uh, I, I've spent most of my, uh, my, my days in the classroom in, in the junior grades. Um, and uh, man, it's, it's, it's a thrill to be here, so thank you. Um, uh, the, the first project I'm going to talk about uh, this, uh, today is, uh, is called Finding Hazel, and it was a project that, that kind of began in uh, sort of over the summer in 2018. I, I knew that we were coming up to um, the the centenary of, of the uh, the Spanish flu, uh, the outbreak of the Spanish flu, and and I wanted to do a unit on it. And uh, my, the school I, I teach in was built in 1857, and it's uh, it's a really um, there's history everywhere. Like on our playground, every, uh, every spring the frost literally pushes porcelain and and uh, uh, bits of nails, and the history is literally in, in the soil here. Um, and uh, I got thinking about uh, about the fact that our, our school was around in uh, you know 1918 and, and had been around for a while at that point. And uh, so I I, I just down the street, uh, just a block from where I, I work, is an amazing institution called the uh, Dundas Museum and Archives. And I, I was I spoke with Anna Patterson, um, and, uh, who you're, you'll meet in a second. And I asked her about the about you know was had the flu impacted our school, um, and uh, our school directly. And in, and uh, and it did some digging, uh, and sure enough, uh, we discovered uh, that unfortunately it had, uh, um, and that a student that it, uh, had attended our school that at, at the time uh, had had passed away. Uh, because of the flu. Her name um, was uh, Hazel uh, Isabel Layden. And, um, and that changed everything. I, I really thought, you know, I, I'd been working out a, a very sort of traditional kind of unit in my head. Um, and there was something about uh, the personal nature of that um, discovery that, um, that, that changed literally everything about the unit, which um, then became something very, very different than I originally expected. Um, but the, the students, uh, we started going to the museum uh, and working with Anna, who, uh, and we, we began chasing a question. And the, the question that drove us for the next uh, five months was, um, who is Hazel? And, uh, and that, that was the question that uh, pretty much every day we, we addressed in some uh, shape or form. And, uh, um, and it was so helpful in, in uh, introducing us to uh, the rich artifacts that, that the Dundas uh, Museum and Archives ha I've had. And I'll pass it off to Anna now um, to, uh, to, to talk a little bit about that. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I hope everyone uh, can hear me okay. Um, I do live in the country, so ooh, sometimes the internet is a little uh, 
wishy-washy. Uh, so yes, Rob, uh, Rob originally uh, came to me with a really sort of open-ended question of um, was anyone directly affected uh, by um, uh, by the the Spanish flu uh, epidemic in in uh, in 1918 um, at uh, at Dundas Central, and so. Uh, what we did is we started some research and looking at um, specifically death records, we were able to find um, records of a student who who uh, did in fact pass away, as as Rob said, he's a laden. Um, and so what we did from that point on was uh, try to, um, to, as he said, figure out who she was. And so that was um, a really fascinating task. It was a really difficult task, um, but it was incredibly rewarding. Um, so going through our archives, we were able to um, find uh, records related directly to um, Hazel, related to her family, um, and then artifacts that also sort of put the whole, um, her life into context of what um, what was going on at the time. So we were able to find things like her, um, her obituary, um, one of the most uh, um, powerful items that we found was her family's card of thanks that they published in the newspaper, um, thanking the community for their support at, after the passing of their daughter. We found articles about the, the Spanish, uh, Spanish flu um, epidemic. And so um, it was going through these these very real physical archives that we were able to really have the kids explore um, the time period um, and specifically the life of this girl um, who who whose life was cut short by uh, by this illness um, and and one thing that became very um, it became a, a very key feature was um, that it was going to become an exhibit. Um, and so we knew that we wanted to put on an exhibit about this. And so we were interested in finding, of course, information about her, but also um, ways that we could illustrate um, to visitors at the museum what this looked like. Um, now, this uh, led to something that was a, a real challenge, but also an incredible education piece, which was not only what we do have, but what we don't have. Um, and so we, uh, although we found like her, her records book, her marks book, we found her marks for her classes um, at Dundas Central. Um, we found, uh, you know, photos and, and things like that of her, of her siblings, of her, of her uh, mother and, and everything, but we never found a photo of Hazel. Uh, because the photo, the, they didn't take class photos every year. The year that they would have taken the class photo um, that she would have been in was 1918 and the school was closed. And then she passed away. So we never found that photo of Hazel, which um, was a big learning point for the kids because it was really hard for them to wrap their mind around someone living and not having a photograph of them, let alone the thousands we have of ourselves today. Um, and as Rob sort of explained, it she became a sort of a metaphor for the experience because it was, you know, very specifically about her, but then also uh, more broadly about um, many people who were affected by by this illness. Uh, and so we did put together an exhibit. There's a, um, a picture of one of the panels there. Um, and we wanted to include lots of context um, from the community and from the time period. So we found, um, uh, we knew that Hazel, uh, was an avid piano player, and so we found some some uh, music that would have been uh, sheet music that would have been popular at the time, and two of Rob's students played it at the exhibit opening. Um, and then there was also a very meaningful moment at the exhibit opening, um, which I will <laughs> let Rob uh, I'll let Rob cover. So we had to, one of the things we had to do uh, is it was we uh, we, we, we we spent weeks with with Anna you know, going to the museum again on a weekly basis sometimes multiple times over a week and we were working uh, we, we realized uh, you know, we, we would get little clues it was almost like um, like like one of these uh, uh, murder mysteries where uh, and I, I don't I don't mean to, to make light of what we were doing or the topic but we were it was it was exciting and, and that we would find clues and they would lead on to, to certain things we found references um, when we were working with some of the the um, uh, the journalism from the period uh, with Anna, um, we we found references to Knox Presbyterian Church, which is just down the road. And you can see um, sort of in, in the center of the panel is uh, is Reverend Garrison, um, and she is uh, she uh, Reverend Garrison was incredible. She she took the the, the project to her, her parishioners um, and and began asking um, uh, asking around. And well, as it turns out. 
Hazel, uh, Hazel's family was very involved during her lifetime at the church. Her family is still involved in the church. And one of the, uh, the, the, the parishioners, it turns out, is the niece of Hazel. Um, and so we got to meet Hazel's niece. And uh, she brought uh, family, uh, all kinds of um, uh, family letters, photographs, uh, uh, all kinds of really fascinating um, pieces of information about her her and her family that began to round out our understanding of, of, uh, of Hazel and who she was. Um, the there were some pretty meaningful things that came out of that. We 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 actually uh, we stood in front of the baptismal font where where um, Hazel was uh, was baptized. Um, and and on, on the far left uh, of, of your screen, uh, you'll see a gentleman uh, by a gravestone. Um, uh, that's Stan Novak, one of the most extraordinary Dundasians uh, out there. He's a a passionate local historian, and he took uh, the class uh, for a cemetery tour, teaching them uh, the history of their community through um, through. The the, uh, the, the cemetery in particular, um, uh, taking us to, to Hazel's grave site. Um, and so the students, uh, you know, we, we reflected often on the fact that we were, you know, we, we literally had stood at the baptismal font where her life in, in many ways began. Um, and, and we were there uh, where, where it physically ended as well. Um, and there was a, I'm, I'm thinking off, you know, we, we kept coming back to this issue of, of, of her life and, and we realized those conversations really led us back to her, to her death and how she died. And that's when we, um, we, we, we reached out to uh, 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 McMaster's Children and Youth University. You've already met uh, Dr. Raha, who um, they're amazing, uh, uh, amazing leader. Um, uh, MCYU, they, they came in with a series of workshops that really helped us explore the disease that killed um, the, the, the killer that took her life. And, and um, this, project in many ways became a, a both a, a profoundly historical project but also one that was uh that was uh, deeply uh, entrenched in in the the science um of 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 uh, of, uh, of the flu um and uh together we we, we built a, a interactive website that's on the the um mcyu uh, uh on, on their site but it's an interactive site there that you see on the right um, that uh, that takes uh, takes people through uh, what 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 we learned about uh, about uh, Hazel's story and about uh, about the 1918 um, flu epidemic. Um, and I, I want to just touch, you know, on on this term of sense making that uh, the the students were, were forced again and again, and this was hard for you for, as a teacher, you, I sort of, you, we get trained to think of ourselves as bringing knowledge to, to the students to then, um, uh, to, to then learn and, 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 uh, and, and make something of. That's, that's not how this was at all. Um, I didn't know where we were going. Um, and, and very often we, we, we had dead ends. Very often we, uh, we, we had sort of cul-de-sacs that, that uh, we had to come out of and, and find other leads. Um, and, but all of this led ultimately to the exhibit uh, that uh, that Anna's going to speak uh, speak a bit about now. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna, I'll give you a quick minute, Anna, but we just got to hurry it along a bit, and I'll make sure that the link to the, the other exhibit, Fatal 5, is included in everything, so everyone can check that one out, too. Absolutely. I'll talk super, super quickly about both of them. So they both ended up being projects that we decided to make an exhibit about at the museum, um, which gave students a chance to um, have that sort of end product that you um, that you spoke about to have, you know, it, have it lead something somewhere uh, concrete while also putting a lot of emphasis on the um, organic nature of the development of, of both the projects. So we were able to put on this exhibit um, at, uh, at Dundas Museum and Archives for um, Finding Hazel. It became a wonderful community gathering. Um, members of Hazel's family met at the exhibit opening. It was really phenomenal. Um, and then the Fatal Five was a project that we just did last year. Um, and I, I'll breeze through it real quick. We wanted to go through and explore the death records again. Um, and uh, and so we were able to, the students did some statistical analysis, which, um, which were the most deadly diseases for children. Um, and then we worked with the artifacts in the museum to discover treatments and, and you know, how people dealt with these things and what they meant and how people felt about them at the time. Um, the picture that's in the middle of the screen is the physical exhibit that did not go up until this fall because, of course, we were faced with our own pandemic. Uh, and so we did do our online version of the, uh, the Fatal Five. Um, which was uh, another exploration that the students did of all of the resources of the community, um, you know, with McMaster, with us, and and with Rob. So that is uh, that was sort of our deep dive into curatorial thinking. Um, and <laughs> happy to answer any questions down the road. Thank you so much. So I'm going to pass it over to Craig Brumwell now to talk about 
story mapping VE day in his classroom. And immediately after that, Gene Tong is going to give us a very quick introduction to Esri Canada and story mapping through their software. Thanks, Jen. Um, so I'm, I'm Craig. I'm in Kitsilano Secondary School in Vancouver. Uh, we're in, in session, so I'm masked up in this common area, and I'm coming to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Salish, or, uh, Squamish, and tsleil And uh, in our breakout group, we were talking about, um, you know, other projects and other things that you've done that feel like cur curatorial thinking. And, and uh, so this first slide um, sort of uh, is my experience with that, and, and you'll see the connection as we go through to the VE75 day stuff. But if you look at the uh, picture on the, on the left of center, um, uh, that's a, that's a, I call it the family geographic journey. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have done this where you get, uh, ask your students to go home and, uh, interview their family and, and find, um, you know, artifacts and letters and, uh, you know, uh, um, plane tickets and, and whatever have you, uh, to, to put together the story of how the, the, the question we give them is how, how did I end up in Vancouver here in whatever year it happens to be. So you can see on that left of center that this is um, this is actually on a um, an, an Esri story map, an ArcGIS uh, um, online story map, one of the older ones called Story Map Journal. And I used to do this on the Bristol board, and it looked you know fantastic there. But uh, digitally and in terms of shareability, um, being able to get kids to go through that such a cool uh, process of of um, you know, investigating their own family and then getting hooked in that historical process and then having to curate that information and then turn it into a story is super powerful. So um, you know, the ability to have one thing happening on the main, at the main stage, which is on the right-hand side and the side panel, which is on the left-hand side, which you can scroll through, you see the dots there, which are the various um, chapters. And then on the left-hand uh, uh, edge there, you, you can see that's sort of the table of contents, the, um, the left screen and you can see my classes there's four of them going across the top of the menu bar and uh there's a little flag um around the world where the the, the, the main subject of their their um curatorial pro um, project uh is from so that's that's sort of cool and then um in 2018 we had our 100 year um centennial at the school and like many schools, we have a big bronze uh, plaque um, honoring the, um, the fallen soldiers from our school. And we did the same thing. Uh, we have an amazing archive at the school. It has scrapbooks uh, full of newspaper articles and uh, school records and all that good stuff that uh, you would be selecting and archiving in the, in the curatorial thinking process. Although at the time, I wasn't using those words. So. Um, again, uh, this was really powerful because it was a, a project that was presented at the um, at the actual centennial event with thousands of people there, and there was a big digital display where the kids could, um, you know, where people could actually go and interact and and click on the family name of each one of those soldiers. You see the red dots on the map of Vancouver there. Those are all those are all soldiers who died from kits um, during the during the Second World War. Okay, next screen, Judd. And so um, Neil invited me to be part of the, uh, of the Defining Moments Canada team last year and, and uh, this exciting project about VE Day 75 and, uh, and doing a similar sort of thing, uh, uh, you know, only now we're moving in towards uh, calling it uh, curatorial thinking. And the idea being that we're going to use these rich resources uh, on the Project 44 site, uh, things like um, you can see the boy in front of the screen down there on the center left. Uh, these are uh, interactive maps that are that have um, symbology and and movements of of the different military units um, in, uh, in 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 northeast Europe in in 19, 1944 45. And uh, there's things like battleground maps, and there's the, the war diary entries. They're all cataloged in there. There's old photographs. There's there's a number of story maps um, that are built in a different skin. Uh, which you see in the right-hand corner there. Um, and uh, this particular one is on Mona Parsons. And so we had these feature um, personalities, uh, feature Canadians that um, these very, very uh, engaging story maps uh, were told the story of. And, uh, but in terms of um, using those as, as sort of models to, to build, uh, do some curatorial thinking and build um, something new to build, something through a, a, a different theme. That's where we sort of landed on by the time we got to the end of the project, which was um, less than five. 
So what I'm sort of showing you here is that uh, in the center of the screen, you'll see a Defining Moments Canada um, page that's specifically on Mona Parsons. And then on the right-hand side, there's you know the, some rich background material that Mike Betchold um, wrote, which is fantastic. And uh, all the all the other assets and and sort of digital uh, um, artifacts that were on the site all got went into the mill of of this curatorial process. So next screen, Jim. And so what I wanted to just to show you here was was the process that they they went through for that. So on the left is a hard copy um, sort of the seven center story structure that they would use to um, uh, you know once they started making going through the process and going through the sense making. Uh, and, and that's in the lesson, you'll see that there. So I, I, Jen mentioned that lesson three and four were the actually built, building of a, of a story map. Um, and then lesson five was when we were all online and this was what can we actually do in, you know, quickly in real time. But in the center there, I've got, you, you guys, some of you might be familiar with Hoplet, which is just, uh, you know, a, a sort of a free, online um, story story building platform where students can collaborate and you know it's sort of like a, a Google Doc where they can all be on and moving things around. So if you go across the top there, you'll see those are the headings of the sentence or, or the, the seven sentence story structure. And then on the right hand side, you'll see um, lesson five. Uh, and in this exercise, students had a choice of three different um, um, sort of uh, collections of photographs. Uh, and they could add to that, they could pull photographs from the, the, the site, um, the, the V75 site and, uh, and the Project 44 materials. Uh, and then they could, they would make observations, they would make one, they would wonder about things and then turn, you know, in turn, turn that into their, into their, um, their final product, which you'll see in the next screen, Ben. Yeah, so these are, you know, these are the, 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 the purpose or the, the deliverable at the end was the, the museum um, didactic panel, right? So uh, what we did here, although they are using another story map to get this material, among other things, they're putting it through the theme of um, resilience. So this is what the, the students, and these are actual projects that we did at the end, end of the year um, that are sort of a, a short and quick ver you know, version of it because things are pretty tight, but I think you can get the idea that they're they're doing some curative text there, and they've selected and uh, assessed certain pictures that they are going to put in. But um, you know, it's it, to me, I'm biased, but it's just it doesn't stand up to a, a story map, which is a pretty amazing way of presenting something. Uh, a because not only are you able to put in photographs and link other photographs and bring in video and and um, uh, and bring in maps, which is so important, right? And, and be able to click pop-ups out of those maps, you're able to share it really easily. So in this online world, you know, you can have an online conference, you can do an online gallery walk. There's lots of uh, flexibility there, but I'll, uh, I'll leave that to, uh, to, to Jean to talk about. So over to Jean. Thanks. And Jennifer, I'm just going to take over and share my screen. Yep. Perfect. Great. So um, as Craig mentioned, I'm going to show you. So I'm a student today and I'm going to take you through lesson five of the Teaching VE Day 75. And I'm tasked to be a museum curator and I need to determine a few things. So the photos and artifacts to display, how to arrange them to guide people through the exhibition, and then everything that connects to the curatorial theme of resilience. So I've worked through selecting and archiving, and now I'm going to use ArcGIS story maps for sense making and sharing. So uh, this is a free tool available to all educators and students in Canada. Story maps are simple to build. I'm starting with my title slide. My work is automatically being saved and uh, it's not viewable by others unless I choose to share it. I can add an image to my um, title slide or a video. It can be on my device or the internet. And I can also um, edit this to choose the focal point of my image. And I can also um, add attribution right in here and link right to the source.
I will continue building my story map by choosing a block to add. So it can be text or media. So there's a number of text options. And since I have my research already done, I can easily copy and paste my content right into here. I'm going to continue adding just by clicking the plus button and choosing what the next block is I want to add. So I'm going to add an image gallery. With each type of block, there's some helpful uh, tips for you. Here I can choose up to 12 images to create a collage. I'm going to reorder these to match um, how I wrote their names in my text. And I'm also going to resize this. I'm going to continue building my exhibit by adding some more text this time in the uh, form of a header and subheading. I can, as I did before, copy and paste some content in here. So I'm going to uh, paste a URL from an image that I got online. I can add attribution to this and a link to the image just as I did on the title slide. And I want my exhibit to continue alongside the image. And I can do that instead of having to jump just below this by choosing how to um, place my image in my story map. Adding a map is easy to this with a tool called Express Map. I can search for a location or a place of importance, even my school name, and add that to the map. I can save it as a point. I can provide additional information about that location. So here I'm going to add a title, description, and an image. I'm even going to change the color of my point. So there's a variety of different options of what you can add to an express map. So you can add points, lines, areas, and arrows. And arrows are a really nice way to show uh, movement in your map. You can continue to build the map now or go and return to it later. Just like with the images, I can change how this looks in my exhibit. I can even provide text to the map so screen readers can access that and it enables accessibility to my exhibit. Another type of text I can add is a quote. I can customize this to a different color, make it bold, or italicize it. You can easily rearrange your artifacts in your exhibit by just dragging and dropping one of your blocks. So I'm going to move the map uh, below my quote. You can embed live content from the internet. So it could be a web page. Um, in my case, I'm going to actually grab a link from Twitter. It's neat because it's still interactive right in my story map. Now we can go to preview our exhibit and see what it would look like when it's published. I can choose the type of device to view it on. So now I'm going to look at it um, on a tablet. As I mentioned, ArcGIS Story Maps is a technology that's free to use in all K-12 education in Canada. It's the same professional level tool that's being used by organizations around the world. And we have lots of support to help you use this with your students. Jen, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much. All right, so we have one more fantastic example of an application of curatorial thinking and Dr. Madeline Mann's going to come back to talk about the unessay and the work she did with her students this year. Yeah, thanks, Jen. So I'll keep it really brief here. So this is, uh, I teach, as I mentioned before, at University of Toronto, Mississauga. So this is coming from a second year course. So this is postgraduate education or undergraduate education rather. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of, again, connections and resonance with a lot of the projects we've already seen and also, as well as with some of the projects and uh, 
um, products that some of my new friends in my breaker room were talking about as well. So with this particular project, this is from a, a second year course called Introduction to Anthropology of Health. And within this, the sort of capstone project, I asked students to consider the history of insulin, think about the individuals involved and the history of diabetes prior to and after the discovery by selecting three individuals, events, objects, et cetera, that they determined had best illustrated, celebrated, or explained this discovery. So the students went ahead and scoured the primary and secondary resources online. This, of course, was last fall. So this was, uh, you know, during the pandemic. Uh, students, therefore, were able to select evidence that they felt best represented their entry points for their, considering, their consideration of this really revolutionary event. Then through the archiving step, the learners were considering what was available to them, both in terms of what's surviving, of course, and what's been written and what was available to, to them digitally and why. So what I'm really excited to sort of just brag on my students here, as I think all these projects are, is a chance to think about some of this really creative and sensitive sense making that is possible. And the students produce all sorts of fabulous things. So I'm just gonna ask Jen to maybe pop to the next slide and I can talk about some of these projects. So there's lots and lots of comic strips, both folks talking about wanting to use new digital tools that they had downloaded or to draw and scan various things. I really like this particular comic strip. This is just a couple of um, sort of frames from a much larger project because of the idea of a defining moment. Here we have the infamous potentially if you know your insulin history coin toss that allowed uh, Charles Best to win the coin toss over a gentleman named Clark Noble to be Banting's lab assistant for that fateful summer of 1921. So the idea of actually you know be entering into history in a very obvious way or sort of stepping back out of history in a really kind of um, invisible way due to a coin toss felt like one of these moments for one of these particular students and he drew the entire comic surrounding sort of the counterfactual versions of you know what could have happened if the, if the coin flip had gone a different way so I felt like that was a really great example and again the student said I'm not a great artist but I, I would disagree I think it looks fantastic and the idea of the sense making was so clear through this project so Jen can we go to the next one what I was really excited, and this is some of the resonance with uh, my new friends in my breakout room, Michael was saying he had a lot of his students making infographics. That's exactly what we're seeing here as well. Students decided the best way was to communicate through a series of three different infographics. This is the advances in insulin research. There was one about the history as well, and as well as some of the challenges ongoing. Another student decided they wanted to make a series of puzzles and toys, at educational toys for children. So created this puzzle with a timeline, also wrote and illustrated a children's storybook for, uh, for kids, and also created an, uh, another a sort of a cube puzzle that once you put it all together, the story of insulin was on all six sides. So truly, it, it, when students were approaching me with these ideas and asking for sort of clearance for the ideas, it was a real, a real pleasure as an educator to just say, go for it. I trust you. Like, let, let's see what comes of this to allow them to think through that process as well. So next slide. Yeah, so the sort of term of forgotten characters, we've already brought up Clark Noble, but another character that tends to get forgotten in the overall sort of grand narrative of insulin is James Bertram Collip, who is the biochemist from University of Alberta, who was over at U of T, was actually able to make it so that you could put it into a human <laughs> and things, which is a very, very important step, of course. However, Banting uh, and McLeod end up being the two characters of the four gentlemen responsible that end up winning the Nobel Prize. And so Collip sort of falls back into history in a certain sense. His the, uh, McLeod actually shared his prize money with Collip, and students really picked up on this idea of the sort of forgotten character. So on the left there, it's a little hard to see here, but that's an image that a student created full of sort of Easter eggs of the history of insulin and this idea of uh, Collip kind of, you know, <laughs> maybe a little sadly looking out the window at, you know, potentially considering his role in history. And on the right here, we have a wonderful illustration from a series of illustrations where call up um, sort of essentially the magician pulling a rabbit out of his hat and showing the, how to synthesize insulin for human use. Very important nod as well to the lab rabbits that uh, call up was also using within his research. So lots of different layers here with these various characters. All right, next slide, Jen, I think it's our media. Yes, I had a student also who embroidered her U of T lab coat with uh, embroidery patterns that she created herself. You're seeing in the top there, one of the lab dogs which will come up and she uh, decided to go with sort of various cell types Types, and there's a, an embroidered pancreas in the center there, which is not necessarily a, a two words I ever thought I would say together, <laughs> but the chance here to say, you know, the, the process and the product were so clear. And she also submitted her patterns and a lot of photographs of what exactly she'd done here, moving all the way into, you know, Eli Lilly company and discussions of um, patents and that sort of thing too. So again, the idea of a student deciding to embroider insulin patents is not something I sort of had predicted at the beginning of this, but that was really the whole point of this, that this made sense to her because she does a lot of embroidery artistry. 
I think maybe the last slide. Oh no, second last. Uh, there was also an interactive game. This was a coded game that three students banded together to work on together because they said they'd never coded anything. And so they decided to try it for this, which again, the heart of an educator sings when you hear that, that they want to try a new way of bringing the story forward. And so using um, archival photographs and making the characters, they didn't do anything creepy and talk to each other, but they certainly um, communicated through this game. And you could lose. I lost several times trying to get to the end of it when I made, a, again, sort of a counterfactual historical decision and went the wrong direction. So uh, really, really fabulous work there as well. And I think now it'll be our last slide. Yeah, the dogs, the lab dogs. Students really, really connected with the story of the um, animal ethics and dogs that were used in the, uh, the dogs that were in some cases, well, the, the dogs that died, there's no one nice way to say this to the pet owners out there whose pancreases were, you know, ligated and changed to um, induce diabetes, essentially. And so the two images there on the left, a student recreated a painting uh, that Banting did himself about his lab, and she inserted Marjorie, the favorite lab dog, into that painting to make her a more primary part of the story. And here on the right, Marjorie, the favorite lab dog, is uh, surrounded in a blue halo representing the uh, Diabetes Canada um, blue circle um, symbology, as well as there is that Leonard Thompson, who's very famously part of the story among the first people to actually receive insulin and essentially, you know, the Lazarus story of um, the restorative properties. So bringing some of these, I guess, again, sort of forgotten characters in other ways forward and communicating it through media that the students really felt either they wanted to give a try to or felt they could best communicate to. Students were also, um, we also ended up with, you know, uh, poetry and rap songs. A student wrote a horror story that is actually kind of bone chilling all about, we you know, what, what's, what diabetes does to the body. And finally, all these works were shared alongside accompanying uh, reflective write-ups. So really giving the students a chance to explain their chosen medium. Now, well, I hope you're getting through this bragging is that it's really, you know, lightning in a bottle, creative expression, the excitement of being able to facilitate these projects and then see what the students are able to, to bring forward. And there, these, of course, were all produced just using the tools available to the students at home. And I thought that's what really communicated to me the importance of this is that this is possible to continue teaching this kind of assignment in future either blended or in-person learning, because this idea of thinking across media and especially across those disciplinary boundaries I really think helps lessen the educational distance that has been imposed by this digital divide. But I'll leave it there. And if you want to see more, um, we can pop the, the link in the chat, I hope, for the little piece I wrote about that. Yes, I'll make sure that link gets shared with everyone. There are some fa fantastic uh, more examples of student work on the website. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to pass it off back to Neil Orford for some very quick last words about how you can get involved with us and what is next for Defining Women's Canada and curatorial thinking. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, wow, I just I'm just loving everything I'm seeing there. Um, can you pop to the next slide, Jen? Is there we are. Uh, so I just want to finish with an invitation to everybody who's been involved today. First of all, thank you for joining us today. But also, along with our, our great friend, Gene Tong from uh, Esri, uh, we're really excited to, to announce a partnership that we have with Esri right now for our next big project, which is commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Nobel Prize win in uh, chemistry for Dr. Gerhard Hertzberg. Uh, who is uh, singularly one of Canada's greatest science researchers, but quite apart from that, his personal story uh, arriving in Canada, uh, escaping Nazi Germany in 1935 is one of those great new Canadian stories that needs to be told. Uh, working with uh, Esri, we're, we, we've got three things on the go to develop some unique software for digital storytelling using curatorial thinking and a lot of the models that you've seen today. Uh, we want to be able to offer for uh, K-12 teachers across the country some free online PD support in use of that uh, ESRI technology. And we want to be able to build out the tools for digital storytelling using the SAS framework that uh, Dr. Mant introduced you to today, specifically with classroom teachers in mind and how they can bring it into their classrooms. So quite honestly, we're looking for teachers from across Canada to join our team, which is growing, growing, growing every day. We're hoping that you might be one of those individuals and that coming out of this event today, you might be inspired to, to, to join the team. So my uh, email is there. Uh, for you to uh, consume and perhaps uh, type into your into your computer right now and say yes I'd like it to be me and I'll just say to, to Jean do you have anything to add to that Jean 
No, um, this is very exciting. And if this is your first time, um, I'm fairly new to working with Defining Moments Canada in a partnership with them. And um, if you haven't worked with them yet, type that email and say, yes, this is very <laughs> exciting. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jean, and thank you to everybody. Jen, I'll turn it back to you for a farewell. Uh, that's that's about it. Thank you so much to Ohasta for hosting us here today and to all of the participants. Like I said, I will make sure that uh, Rachel and Vanessa get a page with all of the links to all of the materials that were referenced today that they can circulate. And we'll also have a page on our website where we host Ohasta's YouTube video of this session with all of those links as well. Um, it's been great to share curatorial thinking with all of you, and we're really excited to start seeing more people use it. And like Neil said, if you wanted to let us know what you think of it, that you've used it and you had a good experience, a bad experience, we thrive off feedback and partnerships, so reach out to us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jen and Neil and everybody who presented today. What an amazing uh jam-packed, amazing, full of uh, incredible resources presentation today. Uh, I'm so excited that you guys were able to, to do this for us um, and uh, that you, you've got some really exciting plans in the works that uh, lots of our members can be uh, involved in. And I'm just seeing like all of the very exciting, uh, very, very nice comments coming in in the chat, which is delightful. So on behalf of OHASTA, I'd like to thank you and everyone uh, for uh, for today's presentation and look forward to future collaborations. Yeah, we did have one question in the chat uh, just a little bit earlier, and I didn't want to interrupt. Um, but the the question was, how do you um, help or work with students who are reticent uh, with delving into their family history or sharing their family history? So are there any tools or ideas um, to help those students who may have some concerns around their background? Yeah, or trauma, yeah. Or trauma, yeah. Yeah, it, it's a great question. I'll just jump in there uh, very fast. First of all, uh, I always turn over uh, um, uh, areas like this to uh, counsel with our wonderful uh, museum curators and people like Anna Patterson. Um, who, you know, who have expertise in this, um, particularly. Uh, um, and and uh, I never want to be in a, a situation where I put a student uh, uh, um, under the microscope to share personal information or personal stories. We want to, uh, we want as much as possible to refract all of these, these uh, defining moments through uh, the lens of others who have lived and micro histories that exist uh, in the archives at our museums and, and collected materials. Um, I don't know if Anna wants to speak about that at all, uh, Anna Patterson, because uh, uh, they're the real experts in this. Um, as well, Anna, we had a webinar last month about um, local libraries and how to access those. So super excited to work with more people like you. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I think my number one piece of advice would be to reach out. Um, you there people at institutions like museums, libraries, culture, you know, historical societies, cultural organizations. Um, we love getting questions like this. We love getting opportunities to partner and to work um, with students and with with educators on on some of these topics. Um, I think that, uh, you know, for for individual students, that is definitely something that they might not feel comfortable with. And I think always making sure that there are um, alternatives um, or or ways that you can kind of all uh, all work together, you know, on something. So rather than kind of each individual student, you know, having a group project, perhaps, you know, Hazel um, and the Fatal Five both dealt with, you know, pretty serious topics. Um, and we definitely took a lot of time, Rob was able to really facilitate well, a lot of um, time to kind of unpack that. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it explore those, those kind of really hard, uh, really hard topics. Um, but we really brought it back to, uh, you know, to her life and then how we could relate to that. So rather than it kind of being about the individual student and sharing that, um, you know, allowing time for some private contemplation um, for, for the students. I hope that was helpful. So um, thank you again, Neil and everyone, Jennifer, for your presentation.
Uh, we'll be sending out a survey and uh, the links uh, very shortly. And the video will be up on the OHASTA YouTube website um, if you need a refresher or to yep. get And up on our webinar page as well. And, so that'll, yep. that'll be up within the next week or so. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks so much, Have everybody. Good night, everyone.